think we can start. It's two o'clock. Thank you very much for being here. Um, and welcome to um, the webinar of KCE on the EQ55L value set for Belgium. We are very pleased that you are here and that you signed up so um, numerously for our webinar. And actually, to start on a personal note, I think this is a very important day for me. Um, a very, very long time ago, uh, still in the context of my PhD study, I developed a value set for the EQ5D3L for Flanders. And now I have had the pleasure to work with a very strong KCE team on the development of a value set for the EQ5D5L, which is much better, stronger, and more robust than the work that I did uh, that many years ago. We received um, support from the Eurocall group, both financially and content-wise, um, and we also could rely on the never-ending efforts of um, our subcontractor who was responsible for the data collection and the uh, guiding, guiding the interviewers who performed the interviews at People's Homes, ProFacts, uh, so a big thank you for uh, Eurocall Group and Profects and also to Cian Sano, who was supporting us scientifically at the beginning of the uh, setup of the study and is also now present to uh, present to you the results of a study on population norms, which is a very important component for the future use of the EQ5D value set. So many thanks to all of you, also to the interviewers and interviewees. Without them, of course, we wouldn't have been able to create this value set. So uh, we would like to give them a big thank you as well. And also, the uh, finally, the, the reviewers uh, that were involved in reviewing the draft reports and the validators of the KCE report at the very end. We have three speakers for you today. Um, the first speaker, speaker is Nicolas Bukert from KCE, who will um, guide you through the process of developing the EQ5D5L value set for Belgium. Uh, next, um, will Lisa van Wilder will present you the development of the population norms for the EQ5D5L. And finally, Ali Salk from the Eurocore Research Foundation will explain to you the more practical details on how to obtain the EQ5D5L and the requirements for registering your study. Uh, we, will we will end the, the webinar at um, half past three. And after every presentation, we will re leave room for questions and answers. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I would like to present to you the, the recently published KC report on an AQ5D5L value set for Belgium. This was joint work with three of my colleagues, so Irina Klimpet, who you have already uh, seen, uh, Stefan de Vriese and Sophie Gerkens, and they, will also, they are also present here uh, today in this webinar. Let me start by giving you some background on why this study was conducted. So in healthcare, decisions are being taken that have an impact on the life and health of people. And this is, for example, the case in the evaluations and pricing decisions of health interventions, treatments, and new medical technology. And to evaluate the impact of health or disease on people's lives and well-being, two elements are frequently taken into account, length of life and quality of life. And while length of life can be easily expressed in terms of time, quality of life is more difficult to quantify. But putting a value on quality of life is precisely what we attempted to realize in this study. And this is important because one needs to be able to trade off both aspects in order to compare very different interventions with each other. Some interventions have a greater impact on length of life, while others have a greater impact on quality of life. A quality adjusted life year or quality is frequently used in such comparative evaluations and brings together both elements in one measure by multiplying life years with a value for quality of life experienced in those years. Quality of life is a very broad concept that can be influenced by many different aspects in life, including health. For the evaluation of disease burden or health benefits, one generally limits the scope to health-related quality of life. That is the specific impact of health on quality of life. And it goes without saying that there are many different dimensions to our health and that each dimension can have a different impact on quality of life. 
Different multidimensional instruments exist and can be used to measure health and health-related quality of life. And one such instrument is the AQ5D, which is widely used in Europe in research and policy making, and I guess also by many of you who attend today this webinar. It's a valid and reliable instrument to measure health in a wide range of health conditions and patient populations. And in the majority of European countries and also in Belgium, the AQ5D is a recommended instrument to conduct health economic evaluations. Moreover, it's also used to measure quality of life in the Belgian Health Interview Survey since 2013. Before this study was carried out, there was no specific AQ5D 5L value set available for Belgium. We had a 3L value set based on a survey carried out in 2003 in the Flemish population. And using a mapping function, this 3L value set can be transformed to a 5L value set, so-called crosswalk value set, but such a transformation has its limitations as I will also show you later on. And from a societal perspective, an update in utility values was needed to better match the change preferences of the general public and to extend our sample to the entire Belgian population. AQ5D 5L value sets are available and are available in our neighboring countries. So why do we not use the Dutch or the French value set? Well, there's research that sh shows that preferences with respect to health or health dimensions differ between countries leading to different valuations and different value sets. And therefore it's desirable to use a Belgian set to inform the Belgian healthcare policy, to set priorities and to take pricing decisions. And so as no value set for the 5L version of the AQ5D was available for Belgium, the KCE was asked to develop such value set based on the preferences of a random sample of the Belgian general public. As you all participate in this webinar, I suppose most of you are familiar with the AQ5D 5L, but in short, it's a generic instrument that measures health in a standardized way using five dimensions of health within each dimension, five severity levels. And the combination of five severity levels in five dimensions allows us to define 3,125 unique health states. In this way, the 5L version has, has improved the discriminatory power of the AQ5D compared to the 3L version with three severity levels and only 243 potential health states. Each AQ5D 5L health state is labeled with a code where each digit refers to the severity level in a dimension, always using the same ranking of dimension. And an individual or patient with health profile, for example, 24315, is characterized by slight problems in walking about, severe problems in washing or dressing himself, moderate problems in doing usual activities, no pain or discomfort, and extreme anxiety or depression. But how can we now compare two or more health states with each other? Or which dimension has a greater impact on health-related quality of life? To answer these questions, we need a value set because a value set relates to each health state one value for health-related quality of life or utility value, um, and this on a scale between minus one and one, with one meaning perfect health and zero equal to death. Values below zero imply that the quality of life in that health state is considered worse than that. And here you can see in this table an extract of the new Belgian AQ5D 5L value set. The utility values here allow us to compare health states, like, for example, the red state, 24315, and the blue st state, 24351. The comparison of both states shows that, on average, the quality of life in the red state is higher and so considered better than in the blue state, according to the preferences expressed by the Belgian general public. As the severity levels of the first three dimensions in these two example health states are the same, and in the last two dimensions, they are reversed. You can already understand from this example that extreme problems in the dimension pain and discomfort have a greater negative impact on quality of life than anxiety and depression, according to the Belgian general public. These utility values from this table can be used to calculate the qualis in cost effectiveness analysis. There are a number of reasons why the preferences of the Belgian general public are surveyed using a representative sample. So first, the value set will be used to shape health policy. 
for example, through its use in pricing decisions in the public health insurance. And these decisions can have an important societal and budgetary impact. Therefore, it seems logical and justified to produce a value set based on societal preferences from the general public with respect to health and quality of life. Second, the use of one value set has the advantage that every health set always has the same value for quality of life. And this would not be the case if, for example, different value sets would be produced for different health conditions based on the preferences from a specific patient population. The use of one value set increases the consistency and comparability of research and evaluations of different interventions in different patient populations potentially carried out in different care settings. And comparability is essential to spend scarce public resources there where they lead to the highest health gains. I will take you now through the steps that we follow to produce a value set. Throughout the process, we followed the most recent protocol developed by the Euracol Group for Valuation Studies, the Euracol Valuation Technology Protocol or EQVT Protocol 2.1. So in the first step, we created a representative random sample of the Belgian population. According to the AQVT protocol, the target sample must consist of 1,000 adults who completed a valid interview and this to ensure sufficient precision in the estimates. Potential respondents for our study were randomly selected from the National Register using a multi-stage stratified cluster sampling with unique unequal probability design. Even though the protocol does not require representative sampling, we consider this to be essential for the validity of the value set and its relevance and suitability in a policy setting. In particular in Belgium, where regional sensitivities in policy making cannot be ignored. We made sure that every region and community was represented in proportion to its population weight. A similar procedure was followed as for the health interview survey where in each province, a number of municipalities are selected at random. The number of municipalities per province is set in proportion to the population size. Municipalities can be drawn multiple times and for each draw, 10 interviews are assigned to that municipality. And as you can see here on this map, there is a good geographic spread of interviews that needed to be collected. In a second step, the interviews are assigned to an age sex category again in proportion to the population in each, in each pro province. We used age groups of 10 years for this. In a third step, 10 potential candidates were selected from the National Register for each targeted interview. This to have backup candidates, but also because interviews can be excluded if they do not pass the quality control process imposed by the AQVT protocol. Once potential respondents were selected, interviewers of the market research agency Profex carried out the face-to-face -face interviews. In the face-to-face -face interviews, each respondent was asked to value 10 hypothetical health states using the composite time trade-off or CTTO. Here you can see an example of this composite time trade-off. So individuals are asked to value a life of 10 years in a specific AQ5D5L health state, represented here by the blue bar of life B. In this example, the health state to be evaluated is state 11122 with minor problems of pain and anxiety and no problems in the other dimension. And these states need to be compared to a life in full health represented by the green bar of life A. Respondents are asked to lower the number of years in life A up to the point that both lives are considered equally good. That is, the respondent is indifferent between living one of both lives. In the example, life A is reduced to five years. When indifference is reached between both lives, the valuation is complete and a value for the evaluated health states can be deduced from it. Sometimes it is possible that the individual wants to trade off all 10 life years in full health and is not yet indifferent, still preferring life A. In other words, the evaluated health state is considered to be worse than an immediate death and will receive a negative valuation. This is the case in the example here on the right hand side, where the worst health state, state 55555, is being evaluated. In such case, case 10 additional years in full health are added to both, li both life A and B. And the trade-off continues. Again, until indifference is reached or all additional life years in life A are exhausted. 
Among the 10 health states to be evaluated by the CTTO, there is always a worst state, so state 55555, and a mild state. A mild state is a health state with no issue in four dimension, dimensions and a minor issue in one dimension. One fifth of the respondents was asked to evaluate one additional health state, the unconscious state. The unconscious state is no standard AQ5D5L state. It cannot be described using the five dimensions. However, we consider this to be an important benchmark state for research and economic evaluations that needed to be included in the Belgian value set, as it was also included in the previous 3L value set. Next, each respondent had to uh, evaluate seven discrete choice tasks in which he or she was asked to indicate which of two states uh, was preferred, state A or state B. It is, of course, impossible to evaluate all 3,125 health states in this way. Instead, researchers have searched for a set of health states to be evaluated that can be used in a model, and uh, this model is then used to produce and predict the complete value set. In the end, 86 health states were chosen for CTTO and 169 choice pairs for discrete, the discrete choice experiment. To ensure high uh, data quality, the AQVT protocol has set up a thorough quality control process that monitors the performance of the interviewers and the respondent. So for example, the time spent to explain the valuation tasks is monitored, the time taken to fill out the survey is monitored, the value given to the worst state is compared to the values given to other states. If interviews do not, do not meet preset quality requirements, they are flagged as being of potentially poor quality. Interviewers with too many flagged interviews need to be replaced and their collected interviews are excluded. Also to improve proof data quality, the AQVT protocol stipulates that between 8 and 14 interviewers should be recruited. This because it's expected that there are learning effects on the job. In reality, we relied on more interviews. First, because some interviewers were excluded and replaced due to poor performance as revealed in either the quality control process or during retraining sessions. Second, because the data collection process took longer than expected, and this for several reasons, such as the need to retrain the interviewers, the COVID-19 pandemic, and the difficulty to recruit participants, to name some. This led to a number of interviewers dropping out and the need to recruit new interviewers to replace them. Finally, after a data collection period running from May 2018 to September 2020, 916 interviews were collected that met the Eurocall quality requirement. So a bit short of the thousand interviews that were targeted, but due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we had to stop the, the study. In a third phase, the data were analyzed and the search for evaluation model started. First, some more data cleaning was performed and a number of interviews were excluded based on the valuation patterns of the respondents. For example, respondents who gave, the who gave the same value to each of the evaluated health states were excluded, assuming that they did not understand the task or did not take it seriously. For the remaining sample, post-stratification rates were calculated to correct for differences between the planned and realized interviews. And these ways, weights were used to calculate the final value set. Next, we looked at the representativeness of the sample. By construction, the sample was representative with respect to province, age, and sex, but we also found that it was representative for health status, health-related quality of life, educational attainment, and employment status. The figure here on the left-hand side shows, for example, the proportion of individuals by self-assessed health, going from very good to very bad. The blue bars give the proportion in our AQ5D sample, while the red diamonds give the proportion found in the SILK survey, the survey of income and living conditions of 2019, and the orange diamonds give the proportion in the health interview survey of 2018. And as you can see, there is quite a good match uh, between uh, these surveys and our sample, leading us to believe that our sample is not biased by either an overrepresentation of the sick or healthy individuals. Similarly, for the figures here on the right hand side, with on top the proportion of respondents by activity status employed, self employed, unemployed, 
inactive and retired. And on the bottom, uh, the proportion by educational attainment. So the highest degree obtained, no, de no degree or primary degree, secondary degree, and tertiary, tertiary degree. Again, we see that the correspondence between our survey sample and the silk is more than satisfactory. Third, we looked for some basic patterns that we expect to be present in the data. We looked, for example, if the values given by respondents decrease as health states get more severe. And this was the case. Fourth, there were some interesting findings in the survey data. We found, for example, that there was only a limited willingness to trade off life years for mild health conditions. We also saw an increasing variability in the valuation of health states as health conditions get more severe. And we see that there is an important share of negatively valued states, uh, health states. And these three patterns will also have an impact, of course, on the final value set. The data collected on the 86 health states and from the DCE were used to estimate the regression model. And it is this model that is ultimately used to produce the final value set. The utility value for, for the unconscious state, on the other hand, comes directly from the survey results. Utility values range between minus one and one. And this mixture of positive and negative values makes it difficult to estimate in a regression model. Therefore, instead of utility, we use this utility in the regression model. This utility is the deviation from full health having a utility value of one. And so therefore this utility is always positive. It ranges from zero to two. The Euroqual protocol does not specify which regression model needs to be used and leaves that choice open for the country team. So we decided to estimate a wide range of models with different specifications based on what was found in the literature and eventually select the best performing model based on four selection criteria. First criterion is logical consistency, which means that the coefficients should reflect that this utility increases as health conditions get worse. The second criterion is the goodness of fit, which means that the model is able to fit or predict values for health states that have been used to estimate the model. The third criterion that we use is predictive accuracy, which means that the model is able to predict values for health states that were not used to estimate the model. For this, we subdivided our data in two parts. One part was used to estimate the model, and another part was not used to estimate the model, but to validate the predicted values from the model. And this subdivision was repeated multiple times. The fourth criterion are theoretical considerations on whether or not to correct for heteroscedasticity, censoring at values of minus one, and the use of a hybrid model combining CTTO and DCE data. Whenever possible, these choices were backed up with patterns found in the data. The final model that we've chosen, the preferred model, is a multiplicative hybrid model. So multiplicative means that you have a coefficient for a dimension and a coefficient for a severity level, and you have to combine, multiply both coefficients. Hybrid means that we use both the CC, CTTO data and DCE, DCE data, discrete choice uh, data, in one model. We use a model with an intercept. The intercept should be interpreted as a disutility that applies to all health state that deviate from full health. The model accounts for random effects, which means that there is individual specific variation around the intercept value. And the model corrects for heteroscedasticity, which means that the model accounts for the increasing variability in the valuation of health states as health conditions get worse. And so in this figure, you can see the correspondence between the observed values in the survey from the CTTO task and the predicted values from the final model for the 86 CTTO health states. Each dot represents a health state. The red diagonal line indicates a perfect match between the observed and predicted values. Above the red line means uh, that the value predicted by the model is higher than the value in the survey. And below the red line in the, um, uh, implies that the value predicted by the model is lower than the value in the survey. But in general, you can see that the dots are centered around the red line, which is a good sign. 
Using the final model, we could derive a utility value for each AQ5D5L state. And I will give, give an example how this works using the health state 24315. So in this table, you have an overview of the model coefficients. There's one coefficient that reflects the disutility in each dimension. So you have mobility, self-care, usual activities, pain and discomfort, anxiety, and depression. And you have one coefficient for each level. However, as you can see uh, in this table, level one and level five are missing from, from the table. And that is because level one is standardized at a value of zero, while level five is standardized at a value of one. A dimension coefficient always needs to be multiplied with a level coefficient. So this means that there is no disutility in case, that the, in case of a level one problem, so no problem with a health condition, as in this case, it is multiplied by a value of zero. Um, the dimension coefficients, uh, in fact, so the disutility related to the dimension coefficients reflect the disutility at the highest severity level, which is standardized at a level of one. So take, for example, this health state 24315. First, you have the disutility related to the intercept. So for all health states deviating from full health, which is the case here. So this utility of uh, 0.038. Second, for mobility, you have a disutility related to the uh, level two coefficient and the mobility coefficient. We multiply both with each other and we get a disutility of 0.032. And we do the same for all other dimensions. So the dimension self-care, usual activities, pain and discomfort, anxiety and depression. Next, the overall disutility is a sum of the disutility in each dimension and the intercept. And finally, the utility value that comes into the value set equals one minus the disutility value. If we look in general at the features of this new value set, we see that the highest utility loss is for the dimension pain and discomfort closely followed by anxiety and depression. And then there is a gap. Uh, and in the third place, we have uh, mobility and then usual activities and self-care. We also see that there's a relatively small loss of utility for level two and even level three, in particularly when you combine it with the dimensions, mobility, self-care and usual activities. The entire value set can be downloaded from the KCE website in uh, several uh, formats. So now I come to my conclusion. So to conclude, uh, let us be clear, we fully support our data collection and analysis, and we recommend to use a 5L version uh, of the value set and of the AQ5D from now onwards. First, because the 5L version is more precise than the 3L version, and hence can better discriminate between patients with mild and severe issues. Second, because the methodology has become more robust. The valuation techniques have evolved over time, as well as the quality control process imposed by the Eurocall protocol, leading to better data to start with. Third, because an update of societal preference from, from the 2003 survey was needed based on the preferences of a representative sample of the Belgian population and not only the Flemish population. And this is also reflected in the value set when we compare the 3L value set with the 5L value set as shown in this figure, where you have on the horizontal axis uh, all, uh, the utility values in the value set and a density line that indicates how frequent such a utility value occurs in the 3L value set represented by the, the red line and in the 5L value set represented by the blue line. And while the peak in the values is quite similar, so the main peak is at 0.2, for the 3L value set and slightly higher at 0.24 for the 5L value set, you can clearly see that the 5L value set covers a wider range of utility values. There is both a higher density of high and low values in the 5L value set compared to the 3L set and a lower density of small positive values. This change distribution and wider range might allow for a better discrimination between patients both for mild and very severe health conditions. And this might improve the applicability of the AQ5D. Finally, we have, um, we have a higher fraction 
of negatively valued uh, states in the five L value uh, in the five L value set compared to the three L value set. The mapping function to generate the three L crosswalk uh, set did not result in a different distribution relative to the three L distribution, except perhaps here between the two peaks uh, where it uh, has smoothed out uh, the distribution in the crosswalk value set. So each KC report ends with a number of policy recommendations and I will do the same. So in this case, uh, for this report, we recommend of course the use of the new value set and we recommend to use it uh, to calculate, uh, uh, to use it in the evaluation uh, of uh, in health economic evaluations. Uh, so that is one. Um, and we will also adjust the Belgian guidelines for health economic evaluations uh, in this respect. Uh, second, we um, recommend to use it to calculate population norms, which our second speaker will present. And third, we recommend to use it, the AQ5D5L more frequently as a generic PROM. So that was my presentation. Thank you for your attention. And if there are any questions, then I'm glad to answer them. Um, for this interesting presentation. Uh, I think there is one question already in the chat. Um, where can we get the data? Could you maybe show again where uh, people can find the data on our website? Um, so on the KC website, every report has its own, um, has its own page. So you, you go to the uh, reports page of the uh, KC on the KC website and you choose the report on an AQ5D5L value set. And then on the right hand side you have uh, a number of options to download the report but also to download the, uh, the value set and you have it in different formats. You have it in different statistical formats, uh, SAS, uh, STATA, R, um, SPSS, etc. Okay, thank you very much. I hope that clarifies where you can find the information. Uh, next question is maybe a question uh, directed to me, maybe. Uh, when is the update of the guidelines for the economic evaluations expected? Uh, we are planning that in the near future, so we will do that as soon as we can. Um, and we will definitely refer, of course, to the uh, new value set. Um, in general, I think the uh, guidelines, current guidance for economic evaluations already refer to EQ5D in general, so there is no explicit mention of the 3L. I think we already recommended the use of the 5L version, but of course um, there was no value set available and we recommended to use a crosswalk uh, value set. Uh, but we will definitely update the guidelines uh, with this new information and with the new value, sh value set as soon as possible. But in the meantime, uh, please know that in, it is recommended by KCE to use this value set. Um, so in principle, it is already um, considered to be a part of the gui guidelines. Um, another question is related to the interviews. Um, someone asks, I suppose that the interviewees got the questions in their own language, Flemish uh, in Dutch, Walloon in French. Um, yeah, that is true. And uh, the German speaking uh, part got, I think, but Sophie uh, might correct me, uh, the interview questions in, in German as well. A question on uh, the differences in preferences for health states between participants from Flanders and Wallonia. Um, how does this set compare to that of other countries was also a question. So it's actually two questions. Is there a difference between the Flemish people and the Walloon people? And secondly, uh, how does the value set compare to the value sets of other countries? Okay, that's the second question, I suppose, yeah. So we, we did not look into detail between differences between the regions in the preferences. So we made sure that um, our sample was representative for each region. So that is not, not, not a problem. Each region is, is represented. But we did not look for differences in the preferences between uh, individuals from Flanders or individuals from Wallonia. So we did not look into that. Um, 
might be a, a, a topic for fu uh, future research, but we have to account for um, if you make uh, regional subdivisions, then the sample gets smaller and so less robust in, uh, in the results. If we look at differences between um, our value set or the Belgian value set and uh, those in other countries, then you see that there uh, are some differences. So uh, if you look at the Belgian value set, which is, uh, uh, I will see if I can spotlight. So here you have the new Belgian value set. Here you have the previous 3L value set uh, in the table. Then you have the German value set, the Dutch, the French, and the English value set. If you look at our uh, Belgian value set, then in uh, the proportion of health state valued and valued worse than death, so negatively valued health states, then it is more or less comparable to the German and the Dutch value set, but uh, quite different from the French and the English value set, where you have fewer of those uh, negatively valued uh, health states. If you look at the preference ranking of the dimensions, then you see that, um, for example, in the German value set, uh, self-care um, leads to a higher uh, disutility or a higher loss in quality of life, according to the German uh, people, than, than it is the case in, in Belgium. Uh, and then if you look at the Dutch value set, then you see that, for example, the first two dimensions are uh, reversed with, the, with our Belgian value sets, where the Bel Belgian uh, citizens say that pain and discomfort leads to the highest loss in, in quality of life, uh, in the Netherlands, that is anxiety and depression. Um, and in France, um, where you have in, in all countries here, uh, pain, this pain and discomfort and anxiety and depression on the first two uh, are the first two dimensions with respect to loss in quality of life in France is, for example, pain and discomfort and mobility, so not anxiety and depression. So there are some uh, important differences. Uh, and on the next slide, you see the, the distribution again. Um, on the horizontal axis, you have all the utility values. Um, and then you have density lines with in blue, the Belgian value set. And in, um, for example, in green, you have the English value set. And you see that there is uh, fewer negatively valued states, as we already saw in the table, and a, a peak that is slightly uh, leading to, to higher values. So at 0.4 utility value instead of 0.25, which is the case in Belgium. So you see that there are some, uh, some differences and these are also discussed in, in the report. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Nicolas. Um, I think we have another question and uh, it's as the person uh, himself says, it's a little bit off topic maybe, but the question is whether KC is planning also Belgian evaluation on disease specific questionnaires. Uh, indeed, this was actually not the purpose of this study. Of course, this is a generic questionnaire and it's, uh, it's very extensive. It's also um, finding page, uh, references from the general public. Um, we, we do not generally uh, systematically do uh, evaluations of disease-specific um, health-related quality of life questionnaires. Uh, but we do collaborate in some projects, like, for instance, the um, IMI project PREFER, which is really looking at uh, patient preferences for um, treatment characteristics. And so there we, we are actually looking and working together with other research groups on uh, preferences of patients for uh, di different uh, uh, health-related quality of life outcomes, for instance. But it's not uh, that, that KCE has a specific uh, line of research on evaluation of Belgian disease-specific health-related quality of, of life questionnaires. It really depends. Um, yeah, we have a procedure where we focus on, on questions that come from, yeah, from citizens, from institutions, from hospitals, from healthcare providers, etc. Uh, and we make a selection. So yeah, it, it, it could be part of the KCE work, but it's not systematically um, our focus of research. Um, then a, another question is the proportion of people with tertiary education a reflection of the Belgian population? What does the EU silk reflect? I think we do have a slide on that as well. Yes. Um, yeah, so the, the EU SILK, uh, the survey on income and living condition is, in fact, it's, it's the benchmark survey on everything to do with um, 
social status um, in Belgium. You see that there is, uh, with respect to tertiary education, perhaps in our sample, a little over-representation of uh, individuals uh, that are higher educated, um, which is also related here with um, the number of inactive people, um, uh, so, which is slightly underrepresented. But in general, I think um, that this still more or less reflects um, or is a good match between our sample, uh, which is a bit smaller than, than the silk sample. So the silk is about 10,000 uh, respondents uh, and our sample uh, about 900 uh, respondents. I think I still think that there's uh, is is a, a a good match between both. Uh, so I think we can then now move on to the next speaker, um, which is Lisa van Wilder from the University of Ghent, who performed a study on the Belgian population norms for the EQ five D five L together with uh, Brecht de Vleeschouwer from Cianzano. Uh, Brecht will also be available um, for answering questions in the chat during the presentation, after the pre presentation, um, or um, even orally. So um, please do not hesitate to ask your questions. We are here to uh, respond to them. Uh, Lisa, please uh, share your screen. Um, good afternoon, um, everybody. First of all, um, I would like to thank the KCE for their invitation to present our latest work at this webinar. So today I'm going to uh, present you the Belgian population norms for the EQ5D5L. Um, but first, let me introduce you myself. So my name is Lisa van Wilder. Um, I'm a PhD student at the Ghent University and I'm working at the Department of Public Health and Primary Care. And together with my co-supervisor, Brecht de Vleeschauer from Cienzano, um, who's also in the audience today, uh, we have been working on the Belgian population on this paper. And uh, very recently, in August, we received the good news that our paper got accepted for publication. So from now on, um, the paper is publicly available in the journal Quality of Life um, Research for those who are interested in the, in the full paper. It may be good to know, like uh, Irina already said, so if you have any questions during or after this uh, webinar, just uh, drop your questions in the chat box and um, Brecht um, will answer them. I'm going to start with a brief uh, introduction to explain why we conducted this research. So as we all know, health-related quality of life is uh, one of the most important patient-reported outcomes as it captures a person's self-perceived physical, mental, but also social functioning. Um, the most popular um, generic instrument the, to measure health-related quality of life is not very surprising, it's the EQ5D. Um, of course, uh, Nicolas already explained the EQ5D in detail, so I'll uh, repeat it very click, quickly for you. As you can see on the slides, the EQ5D consists of five dimensions, namely mobility, self-care, usual activities, pain, discomfort, and anxiety, depression. And each dimension has five response categories. And um, that's also why it's called, of course, the EQ5D 5L. And from these uh, response categories, uh, EQ5D score or utility score can be calculated. And as you all know, um, these scores range between zero, which means death, and one, which means perfect health. And as you also uh, know, um, negative values can also be generated for health states perceived worse than that. And as such, the EQ5D um, could generate population norms for specific countries or regions. And these population norms, they can be used as reference data to, for example, to compare the health profiles of ill patients with the data for the average person of the same age and gender in the general population. And in this way, the population norms, they help us do, to identify the burden of disease, but also to assess population health and health inequalities. And nowadays, many countries um, worldwide include those health-related quality of life measures and mostly, of course, the EQ5D in their national health surveys to obtain the population norms. And that's also what Belgium has done. So Brecht and I, we calculated the 
population norms for Belgium with the EQ5D5L. Um, now I will give you some information uh, about the methodology of our paper. Our results are based on the Belgian Health Interview Survey of 2018. So the Belgian Health Interview Survey is a cross-sectional household survey with a representative sample of the um, Belgian population. Um, participants were selected from the National Register to a multi-stage stratified sample of all people living in Belgium. And the sampling design uh, involved a geogra geographical stratification so um, they started with Belgium as a whole, and then there was a selection of uh, provinces within Belgium, then a selection of municipalities within provinces, then we had a selection of the households within the municipalities, and finally we had a selection of the respondents within the households. Um, in 2018, we had a participation rate of 58%, and only individuals who were aged 15 years and older, who, who, who were able to complete EQ5D were eligible, and this was uh, 85%. In 2018, we had a sample size of around 7,500 people with a mean age of 48 years, and most of them were women. Um, our statistics, st statistics I'm sorry, were uh, done in R and we took the design effects of the survey into account. And in order to obtain the EQ5D scores for each respondent, we used, of course, the newly developed Belgian uh, EQ5D values, value set. For the EQ5D dimensions, we used uh, logistic regression because the outcome uh, variable was a binary variable um, with um, no problems versus any problems. And for the EQ5D index values, we used uh, linear regression models because the outcome was a continuous variable. All models were corrected for gender, age, education, and region. And now the most uh, important part, I guess, the results. Um, in 2013, the average EQ5D index value was 0 0.86, and this value decreased significantly to 0 0.84 in 2018. If we compare our score with the score of other countries, um, we see that we have a, a very low score. For example, the uh, EQ5D index value of uh, France was 0 0.87, and even Italy had a, a higher score, uh, a score of 0 0.92. If we uh, take a look at the EQ5D dimensions, we see that uh, the majority had problems with pain discomfort, and over a quarter had problems with anxiety, depression. 19% had problems with mobility and uh, as well as with usual activities and only 6% had problems with self-care. Our results are in line with the results of other European countries uh, because uh, there was also um, the trend that uh, problems of pain discomfort had a high prevalence while problems with self-care had the lowest prevalence. If we uh, have a look at the gender specific results, then we see that women had worse uh, scores on the EQ5D index compared to men. As you can see on the slide, women had a score of 0 0.82, while men had a score of 0 0.87. Um, women had also uh, more problems on all the dimensions, but uh, particularly on the dimension of anxiety, uh, depression but also on the dimension of pain discomfort. And this pattern, so of women having a worse EQ5D outcome, outcomes is also very similar to the findings of other countries uh, in Europe, but also in other parts of, of the world. If we look at age, then we saw a decreasing index value by age. And we also saw that people of older age ages had more problems on the EQ5D dimensions, and we saw a sharp increase, especially in the dimensions of mobility, self-care, and usual activities. Um, this finding um, is also uh, in line with the increasing uh, yeah, disability at older ages, ages which was uh, previously 
documented uh, in Belgium. And finally, um, we also had some results on education. So we uh, found that education was uh, associated uh, with uh, worse, uh, low education was uh, associated with worse health related quality of life. So people with low education had a score of 0 0.75, while highly educated people had a significantly higher score of 0 0.88. And this result also emphasizes the socioeconomic inequalities in health, a result that is also has been shown in Europe and, and the world um, in general. So um, these results are as, as expected, expected, I'm sorry, and um, yeah or in line with what we saw in um, other countries. Um, I also included uh, this figure because it nicely illustrates the results on the EQ5D dimensions. So uh, as you can see, I don't know, yeah. As you can see, most problems were reported for the dimension of pain discomfort, while the opposite re um, result was seen for the dimension of self-care. And in this figure, you also nicely see the gender gap between men and women. So we see that men had less problems on the dimensions compared to women. I also included this figure, which illustrates the EQ5D index values. Um, so as you can see, the scores of um, 2018, so it's a blue line here, these scores uh, were lower than the scores of the survey in 2013. It's the red line. Um, in this figure, you can also see it's not um, very clear, but you see that men had uh, higher scores compared to women. Um, but what you, what you uh, really uh, can see in this figure is um, the decreasing uh, EQ5D index values for age. You, see at the age of 75 years that the line of the EQ5D index values are uh, decreasing. Uh, also very important uh, to note and to mention is that people who uh, were living in Brussels or in Wallonia had significantly lower uh, values compared to people who lived in Flanders. And then um, in conclusion, so what can we conclude uh, it from our paper is that older age, uh, female gender, Brussels or Walloon residents and low education were significantly associated with lower health related quality of life. We can also conclude that our Belgian population norms appear to be consistent with those from other European countries, but there are some differences like I mentioned earlier. And these differences can be explained by, for example, um, cultural differences in health perceptions, but also, uh, for example, differences in the methodology used uh, within the surveys in the specific countries. It's also very important to note that our results, results may be biased uh, by excluding participants who were not able to complete um, the questionnaire. Um, these persons are normally in worse health, so they probably have a worse health related quality of life. And that's what we call a healthy volunteer effect. Uh, moreover, there could also be a bias um, due to educational differences in survey participation. And a final limitation of our study is that we do not have any results on the visual analog scale um, because the scale was excluded from the survey in 2018. So um, to conclude, it's very important to further include the EQ5D in the future health um, surveys. Um, because then we will be able to further monitor the health-related quality of life of our Belgian population, but also to further uh, investigate the health burden and uh, the disease burden, I'm sorry, and the health inequalities. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Lisa, for your very interesting presentation. It has um, triggered a lively discussion on our chat. Um, I think many of the questions are already um, responded by Brecht. Um, I think there's quite a lot of interest also in the uh, EQ5D youth value set, which we don't have. Of course, we don't have, we haven't developed uh, an EQ5D uh, 
youth uh, value set, but I think Ellie might want to elaborate a little bit on that because she says there is one forthcoming. So maybe uh, Ellie, you can clarify that. I think that's important for many of uh, the people in the audience to know what to do with children, actually. Uh, yes, so the Yurko has a has a different instrument with the EQ 5D 3 L as the oldest instrument. The, it's um, successor, the EQ 5D 5 L with more levels and a better uh, accuracy of uh, describing health. And we have the EQ 5D Y, an instrument for children. And it just happens to be the case that one of our Yurko members, Sarah de Wilde, uh, she works at uh, She Consulting, She Company. Uh, she, she has developed a value set, and I think that the mem that people at K KCE are aware of the study, but it couldn't be run under their uh, remit. So it's it's separate, independent uh, study. Um, let me see. We have internationally there are only two value sets for the EQ five DY published at the moment, uh, and the Belgium will probably one of the first that is also going to be published because the data collection has been completed somewhere earlier this year. Um, there's also an, an interesting question, I think, especially for those who are doing clinical research about the minimal clinical important difference on the EQ5D. Um, what is this minimal uh, important difference? And uh, Brecht already answered to that, but I think Brecht, maybe you can clarify a little bit on that because I think that's also of interest to many people. Yeah, so the, the initial question was um, which um, difference we considered. Um, so there we had a look at literature and we actually yeah, concluded that literature is also not consistent in, in which um, value to apply. Um, but we, uh, we do mention a uh, minimal clinical importance difference of uh, 0 0.074, uh, which would then imply if we strictly follow this, uh, this rule that uh, the difference between men and women um, might not be important. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if I personally fully agree to, to follow such a rule of thumb. Um, if we do observe, based on a large sample, a statistically significant difference, we also observe differences in the proportions of the underlying dimensions, then from a public health perspective, this does trigger the, some alarm bells. Um, but I understand that we need to be able to interpret this in not just in a statistical point of view, but also in from a, a biological or clinical point of view. Uh, but still observing these differences, uh, which are actually also in line with other researchers, other uh, studies that also find, um, of course, differences between men and women, decreases in quality over life uh, across time, and because that's another question that is popping up. Um, so these findings can, to some extent, be related to, um, to differences in, uh, in sampling, uh, et cetera. Um, but given the coherence with other studies, we do think that there's at least uh, some element of reality in, uh, in these differences and in these uh, decreases over time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Greta. I don't think there are any further questions right now. Um, so that means I suppose that everything was clear for the audience. Um, I just wanted to say if there are any questions after the webinar, you can still uh, send us an email uh, with further questions and we will try to respond as, as quickly as possible. Um, I can imagine that maybe it's a little bit much the information that you are getting right now, but uh, you will have time to to look again at um, recordings later on and then uh, ask your questions via email and you can send them to, to the person who presented or uh, to KC General. Um, we'll make sure that the right people will um, be able to respond. Um, if there are no further questions, I propose that we move on to the next speaker and I'm very honored that Ali Stolk is willing to present here today on this important webinar for us. Um, Ellie will talk to you about the more practical aspects related to the use of EQ5D5L and she is already sharing her screen, which is excellent. Ellie, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, well, thank you, Irina, for the invitation to uh, make this presentation about how to obtain EQ5D. 
Um, my name is Ellie Stolk. I'm scientific team leader in um, at the Yerko Research Foundation. And in that capacity, I've been involved uh, from a distance uh, with this study because we uh, work closely with study teams that, that collect value sets for the EQ5D instrument. Um, it's been a pleasure to work with Sophie, Nicholas, Irina and, and Stefan. Um, and uh, this is also why I was very happy to accept this inv invitation. Um, it's also interesting that uh, all the scientific uh, stuff has been explained by Nicholas and by Lisa. And um, I'm here basically to tell you a little bit more about EQ5D and the organization behind EQ5D. And that would be Yerko Research Foundation. Um, the EQ5D, uh, I think a lot of people in the audience will probably know what EQ5D is. Uh, it is a standardized measure of health-related quality of life uh, developed by the Yerko Group and widely used over the entire world in clinical studies and in economic evaluations and in population health surveys. Um, the instrument was Originally, I think designed or intended to be used for the economic evaluation purpose, but it gained a lot of traction in the uh, other fields as well. And it's, I think the reason for its popularity is that EQ5D assesses health status in just five dimensions of health, and they are generically chosen. So they do not reflect health of a single patient group, but they, they, they were chosen to be relevant to most people. Um, EQ5D also includes the sixth question, which is the EQ VAS, visual analog scale, and that scale allows patients to rate their own health. Um, so EQ5D, in fact, gives you three pieces of information. It gives you the, the EQ VAS score, it gives you a descriptive profile of the health of patients, and it gives you uh, a number attached to that health stage representing a social value. And depending, of course, on your application of EQ5D, uh, you can emphasize one of these uh, results more than the others. EQ5D can also be referred to as patient reported outcome measure, as a PROM, because patients can complete the questionnaire themselves to provide information about their current health and how this changes over time. And I think uh, this word PROM didn't really exist when the EQ5D was developed. So sometimes people are confused uh, whether this is a PROM or not, and indeed it is. Lastly, EQ5D is the is complete name of this instrument. Uh, it's not an ab abbreviation of sorts. It's the correct name to refer to the instrument. If you want to mention it in a paper, the only thing you might want to add is uh, the three level or five level in the uh, description of the instrument. EQ5D was developed by the Eurocol group. A lot of people are unclear what is Yurko and what is EQ5D, because EQ5D is Yurko's instrument and they're often uh, conflated. Well, uh, the Yurko group is a group of researchers. They got together years ago in 1987 and developed this instrument. After the instrument was developed, the Yurko group um, shared the responsibility for management of that instrument with the Yurko Research Foundation. And the foundation today manages the distribution and licensing of the EQ5D. So it's a copyright protected instrument and you can obtain it from the foundation. The foundation provides EQ5D free of charge to all non-commercial users um, after you've registered your study. Com commercial users, however, are charged a fee. Uh, the foundation is not for profit and all the revenues that we get from um, paid licenses, they are invested back mostly in research, but also a little bit in education and user support. And lastly, about Yurko, the office staff, and I'm part of that office staff, is employed by the Yurko Research Foundation. The Yurko group has members and they're not employed by the foundation, but these members, they are actively supporting the agenda of the Yurko Research Foundation. Uh, and the mission of the foundation is to further the field of health related quality of life assessment. 
how to obtain EQ5D. Well, I, I, I was expecting that the development of this uh, value set for the EQ5V5L in Belgium could result in a push or more demand for the instrument. So I included this how to obtain EQ5D in the presentation. Um, while versions of EQ5D might circulate among the users who have had access to the instrument before, the foundation prefers to be the single point of distribution of the Jurko instruments and prominent among these, the family of EQ5D instruments I mentioned before. To obtain EQ5D and officially obtain a license, you need to register your study and you can do that at our website www.jurko.org. Uh, this takes about 10 minutes, so it's, it's rather easy to complete. And at the website, the registration buttons are very, very easy to find. It, they need to be found easily because we handle over more over 6,000 registrations on a yearly basis. After registration, the Yorker office will contact you by email and inform you about the terms and conditions that apply to your license request. Uh, usually, you receive a reply within five days. Um, although uh, sometimes we cannot meet that, but we try to. And please keep in mind that we are a small scale charity doing our best here. Um, a license policy is the next topic in this presentation. Uh, as said, non commercial use um, is for free, and the majority of all EQ5D uh, registrations are indeed simple non commercial requests they make up about 90% of the total. So these users will receive EQ5D for free without a charge. And the license gives those users the right to use EQ5D in the study that they just registered. So not outside of the study, they cannot distribute it, but in that single study. Um, the process is very quick because you register your study, you receive terms of use. And if you uh, agree to those terms of use, uh, you are directed to a portal where you can download your EQ5D version. So this process, in fact, doesn't involve people anymore and is automated and very fast. There are, however, also for non-commercial users, some cases where a license agreement needs to be drawn up or where there are some costs involved. And this is applicable when a user wants to modify EQ5D. Um, or when EQ5D is collected digitally on a non supported platform or when your sample size is very, very high. Well, what is a modification? I think that's the most interesting group of um, license agreements we draw up. This is, for instance, when you need to modify the recall period of your study. EQ5D asks about health today, but some users want to make that a week or they want to make that a retrospective quality of life assessment. Um, there's also some people who, who want to add bold on extra dimensions to the EQ5D, which is also which also constitutes a modification. And then in such circumstances, you modify the instrument that you need to draft, uh, or yeah, you need to arrange a license uh, with with, this, with staff of the Oracle. And there can be some going back and forth on email about that. Um, the digital digital cost recovery fee. Uh, cost recovery fee is about reproductions of your call. If you want to collect data with your call on a non-supported digital platform, for instance, some bespoke software owned by your organization or preferred by a vendor, in such cases, the EQ5D will be programmed into that software. And th there's currently a checkup uh, of whether the reproduction of EQ5D meets our standards. And this again means a person receives your screenshot and is going to check whether it meets our standards. Well, this is um, time consuming and costly at our end. So there's a small cost involved in such circumstances, uh, which is, well, it's not bad news for the cost, but a lot of users uh, hate this or don't really like this uh, trajectory because of the time. It also takes it going back and forth. And this policy will be abandoned somewhere in the uh, next couple of months where it will be clarified that it's the responsibility of the user to ensure a correct representation of EQ5D and you will get access to examples from us. Finally, what constitutes a large sample size and uh, need or in need of a license agreement that 
opinions about that are also shifting a little bit, but currently that threshold is set at 5,000. Um, then for commercial users, commercial users, uh, for instance, pharmaceutical companies who include EQ5D in a data collection about one of the novel products and they want to file for reimbursement at some point in time, they will be charged a fee for the use of EQ5D. Um, commercial users receive a license agreement per EQ5D version, uh, mode of administration and language, but not per study. The license fees are calculated over these versions and so, uh, but they will remain valid for three years and you can, the, the commercial user can include it in any study that he likes included in. These commercial requests, they involve costs. So that means that there will always be a license agreement drawn up and that costs a little bit of time um, because it involves people, but uh, please know that the commercial request will be handled with priority at our end and we uh, try to meet all requests within uh, a response time of five business days. Uh, currently, um, and perhaps in line with our charity uh, objectives, is that also commercial users do not pay licensee fee for studies on COVID. Well, the registration steps, some people uh, are a bit nervous about registering and first off, let me start by saying that registering a study does not obligate the purchase of an EQ5D license because upfront you do not know which terms of apply and obviously you need to agree to this, those terms. So registering doesn't oblige you to anything. The registration steps are fairly simple. We, we first present you the question whether it's a commercial or non-commercial request. After that, you enter your contact details on how you intend to use the study. So a very high level summary of the study. Then, and that's the important part, then you select the instrument that you require from a list of the over 2000 different versions that we have. And this is across the three different approved instruments, the five or the three level on the Y version, but also for a mode of administration and a language version. So in Belgium, you will use multiple language versions and commercial users might have multiple license uh, agreements uh, drawn up, whilst uh, non-commercial users can request anything they need for free, even if that's 40 versions. Whatever is available will be made available to you fairly quickly. Um, so after this, after you selected the versions you need, uh, you received confirmation email with either the terms of use to accept very quick or a draft license agreement uh, to follow up on with the office team. And after the signature is set on the terms of use or on a license agreement that's finalized, then you can go to a website and uh, get your versions. Um, obviously, it's also possible that you would like to have a version that doesn't yet exist yet. For instance, the EQ5VY is relatively new, so we may not have it in all languages and in all mode of administrations just yet. And then you, uh, you can indicate it in the registration process if you want to have a non-available version. And at that point, uh, again, the office team will contact you uh, to discuss next steps. And they, they include uh, timelines for how to deliver such a version, costs involved to you, timelines at our end. Um, and then you can say whether or not this is something that you uh, want to go along with or not. Um, yeah, post, post marketing or po post use of EQ5D, the Yurko Foundation becomes active again. Uh, you bought your license on EQ5D, but in line with our mission and vision, we would like to support your research. We believe um, in health related quality of life assessment and the role that it plays uh, to make better decisions in health. Um, well, to support that mission, the budget that we get from uh, paid licenses that goes back into research, research, education and user support. So we're not for profit. Minus the office cost, most revenues will be used to fund new research. And currently we have close to 300 projects ongoing worldwide. Uh, recent collaborations with, with Belgium obviously included the development of this value set that we're talking about today, but also of the EQ5DY three-level value set, the child, child value set that is uh, forthcoming. 
uh, and we're open to more collaborations in the future. Um, and in research, it furthers the field in a broad sense. For instance, to learn about psychometric child health valuation, performance of instruments in certain conditions, valuation methods, and what have you. Um, if this interest, if there's a mutual uh, interest in some of your research, we, we'd like to collaborate with you, and we can also fund research. Um, then, of course, we also have our education and user support. And a very important question is how to analyze the EQ5D data. Um, users of EQ5D have different levels of expertise and they have different needs. Um, and especially PROM use of EQ5D is also relatively new. So in a cost utility study, you would quickly go to the calculating, uh, to calculating values attached to the EQ5D health states, and then you can do your parametric analysis collect means, look at difference pre and post treatment and what have you. In PROMS use, there's a broad variety of uh, research possible. And uh, earlier this year, uh, the book shown on this slide uh, was published. It's an open access publication and it includes a rich set of examples of how EQ5D data uh, yeah, can be used, and especially in the context of PROMS, where the focus is more on the descriptive system than on the, the social value. Um, the book also obviously discusses which set of analysis is most relevant when. Now, where it is possible, we would also provide uh, or try to provide analytical tools. So such as a statistical code to deliver some of the type of analysis shown in that book. And uh, as suggested by Nicolas and Irina, the algorithms to attach Belgium values to EQ55L health states, well, they are also publicly available, in this case, from the KCE website. Uh, so we hope to see more collaboration with uh, people from Belgium. We believe that the efforts from KCE and other superior values set for the EQ55L will be an important step in in health-related quality of life research in your country. Um, we'd like to see more collaborations and therefore if you have any question of uh, about possible collaborations, please contact me. And then I would hope that uh, in some time in the future, this picture which was taken in Belgium in 2019 will actually include also some people from Belgium because this is the membership of the Euroco Research Foundation. So the people that support uh, the agenda, uh, I should say membership of the association, this is the group. And I don't think it includes a, a Belgian researcher just at the moment. The researchers here are from all countries across the world, Asia, New Zealand, um, Latin America, Europe, US, you name it, even Africa is represented here. So we'd love to see more Belgian people active in the field. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ellie. That is really impressive, and um, and and I think yeah, you gave a very complete and and very clear um, uh, good information on on how to use the EQ five D. What is going on also at the foundation, which is really interesting. Um, I, I just was wondering one thing. Uh, there is an enormous amount of research going on still in the Eurocall uh, in the, on the EQ five D. I was just wondering to what extent is is it feasible or is research going on to revise the number of dimensions of the EQ5D? Is that something that you will definitely keep? Uh, or Because we have seen this movement from the EQ5D 3L to the 5L version, which was a huge um, change, I would say. Um, but I was wondering to what extent, because we often hear from patient organizations, for instance, that the EQ5D, the five dimensions are not covering everything. And that's obvious, of course, it's not covering everything. But one of the things that is uh, especially not covered and that is highlighted by many patient organizations is the fatigue. So there's no, you have definitely heard from that critique, I suppose, that uh, fatigue is something that is very present in many patient populations. It's not covered by the EQ5D, uh, yeah, 5L or 3L, whatever. So I was just wondering, uh, out of curiosity, is there still research going on, on in that level? 
Um, well, I, I think the EQ 5D will stay what it is. We have three level versions, we have five level versions, and we're not going to do much about that. Um, the East is interest in bold on in bold on, so added dimensions, six dimensions, seven dimensions, which you can present with EQ 5D in a questionnaire or include in your survey. But for valuation, these extra dimensions present an issue because the, the strength of your call is, of course, its comparability across all the patient group. But if you add specific dimensions used only in a certain patient group, uh, that comes at a cost here, the cost of comparability. So this is, um, I, I, there is research happening around in which clinical areas uh, your call may not be um, uh, completely capturing all the outcomes relevant to patients. And then uh, potential solutions are also being investigated with boredoms being one possible direction. Although this idea has been around for a year of then, and it's not hugely popular. So I, I think most users and your members alike are keen to preserve the comparability. And then you accept that by selecting a limited number of domains to try to capture health outcomes across the widest set of people, you cannot tailor to everyone. So that, that's a fundamental limitation that all instruments of this type will have. Um, the other thing worth noting is that uh, there is a new instrument that your course collaborating on. It's called the EQHWB, uh, and HWB stands for Health and Wellbeing Questionnaire. It's also a your call product. It's an early stage. Um, it's, it's in an early development stage, so it's an experimental version. We've just about uh, delineated a set of some items and dimensions to go into the instrument, and there's not a value set yet. It's also not the final version of this instrument, so items are still being scrutinized. Uh, but th this instrument is developed because we observe um, from users and from stakeholders like NICE and other major agencies like KCE, for instance, that, that, that there's also this interest in sometimes broader outcomes when a health intervention doesn't just affect health, but also well-being. And uh, yeah, this is the demand that we also try to meet by yeah, seeing about this new instrument, how well it works. Uh, currently, that instrument is available to collaborators only, so it cannot be adopted in clinical studies yet, but if you feel that you have data that can help everybody learn about properties of that instrument, a collaborator status can be obtained and you get your instrument. That's very interesting. Uh, I think it shows that very fundamental research is still continuing at the Euracle Foundation, and I think that's very important and very interesting to hear. Um, and there is a, one person in the chat who asked two very practical questions. How much time does it take to fill in an EQ5D5L questionnaire? So I suppose um, she's referring to the, the descriptive system and the visual analog scale. Uh, for someone who is really fluent, a fluent reader or a less fluent reader. Mm -hmm. And then the second question is, uh, does it have to be in writing? Uh, does it have to be individually? Um, by a participant or can it be in an interview form? Yes. Well, I think uh, for most people it takes less than two minutes to administer the EQ5D and that's in whatever self-administered format. So it used to be a paper version, but in this digital time, um, paper versions are, are still used, but there's also more and more use, of course, of EQ5D in, in some digital form. Um, but we have, yeah, this is part of the mode of admin, of the mode of administration suite that we have of the instruments. Uh, we have self-administered versions for paper, for computers, for PDA. We have interviewer admin administered versions for use over the phone, but also for use in a face-to-face -face setting. I think these two have been harmonized in most countries that it's a single interview version. Of course, we also have a proxy versions, so where the respondent is unable uh, to express his health status on these dimensions. Um, yeah, and this is this is the choice that you make if you register your your study. Which of these versions exactly do you need? Because if you present a proxy version, you you cannot refer to how good is your health, because then it needs to be how good is this person's health, and so on. And all these uh, small differences between versions they are formally part of the Euracol yeah suite of instruments, and this is why we have two thousands of these different variations. 
Um, personally, I think it's, it's a good thing, therefore, that all studies are registered and that you therefore go to Yurkle to get your versions because you don't know what's circulated. It could be an older version or it could be yeah, a version that is uh, designed for use uh, by the patient and not for use by a proxy or the other way around. Um, and I think especially from a quality assurance perspective, it's, it's key for us that we're able to ensure that you have the right version especially if you're a commercial client and you have um, reimbursement riding on collecting this kind of, of data, yeah, it needs to be bulletproof. And that's also quite challenging at our end, you could imagine. I mean, we have uh, Japanese versions and I, from looking at the instrument, I don't know what it says, you know, it could be anything. It could be a shopping list. Uh, uh, so we have uh, very strict quality assurance procedures to ensure that users get exactly what they need. Mm -hmm. You have some kind of um, help desk at the Euro Foundation uh, for people having questions, for instance. So suppose you have registered to study and you still have a question. Um, is, there, is there some kind of um, yeah, help desk? Yes, well, we have... Um, uh, a dedicated email address, user support, I think, at yourcall.org, which you can find at our email. And if anytime you have a question of any nature, you can just uh, contact us via that email address. If you have scientific questions, of course, you can also come directly to me and I'll make sure that your question uh, is addressed by the people with most knowledge about what you're asking. That's wonderful. Okay, thank you very much. I don't think there are any further questions, at least not in the chat right now. Uh, and as said before, I think if there are further questions, you can also uh, send them to us after the webinar. Um, then I think we can slowly go to closing this webinar. And I wish to thank, of course, all speakers. Um, it was very interesting, very clear. Um, also, a big thank you to all the participants. Um, you were very numerous today. Um, we are very pleased by that. We are very honored by that, by your interest in this work. And um, of course, we hope that the EQ5D5L will be used now in the future uh, as a standard instrument for measuring health-related quality of life in, in clinical studies and uh, in uh, also in economic evaluations. Uh, so please keep an eye on our website also for the update of the guidelines for pharmacoeconomic evaluations and budget impact analysis. Uh, we will make the update and we will publish it as a, a third version right now because uh, we already published two um, versions of the, the guidelines and now it's uh, still up to change. So it will be the third version. Thank you very much and uh, have a nice continuation of your day and a happy uh, weekend. Thank you.